Do the people who knew Chuck close when he was growing up in Tacoma, Washington still remember him? If his teachers come across his name in the newspapers or art magazines, do they recognize this celebrated artist as the uncoordinated kid in their classes with the Coke bottle eyeglasses and the expectant smile? They didn't think he'd amount to much, let alone become famous. I was dumb, a shirker, lazy, my mind wandered. This was written on my report cards. Today he realizes that his school problems were caused by serious learning disabilities, but he wasn't tested and diagnosed until his own children were in school. During his childhood in the 1940s, most educators didn't know about learning disabilities or dyslexia. He spent hours by himself drawing. When every kid on the block wanted to become a policeman or a fireman, I wanted to be an artist. It was the first thing that I was good at, the first thing that really made me feel special. I had skills the other kids didn't have. Art saved my life. At school, Chuck's learning disabilities made studying an ordeal. But instead of giving up, he figured out his own way to concentrate. I filled the bathtub to the brim with hot water. A board across the bathtub held my book. I would shine a spotlight on it. The rest of the bathroom was dark. Sitting in the hot water, I would read each page of the book five times out loud so I could hear it. If I stayed up half the night in the tub till my skin was wrinkled as a raisin, I could learn it. The next morning, I could spit back just enough information to get by on the test. Told by his school advisor not to bother with college preparatory classes, Close ended up at a junior college near his home after high school graduation. The open enrollment policy meant anyone could sign up, even someone like me who had never taken algebra, physics, or chemistry. There he got lucky. The pride of the school was the art department. The football team got new jer jerseys only if the art classes didn't need new supplies. Chuck had hoped to be an illustrator, designing magazine covers or cartooning for Disney, but after he took his first commercial art classes, he changed his mind he would be a painter. He went on to the University of Washington and then this young man who had once been labeled dumb was accepted by the Yale University School of Art. The learning disorders had not disappeared but the painstaking discipline he had developed to get through school became the beginnings of a detailed system to organize his art. Almost every decision I've made as an artist is an outcome of my particular learning disorders. I'm overwhelmed by the whole. How do you make a big head? How do you make a nose? I'm not sure. But by breaking the image down into small units, I make each decision into a bite-sized decision. I don't have to reinvent the wheel every day. It's an ongoing process. The system liberates and allows for intuition. And eventually, I have a painting. Close's teachers always told him he had a good hand. He explains this to mean both some technical ability and the knack of making art that looks like art. In other words, he could paint in the traditional accepted styles. In college, I made the same shapes and color combinations over and over again because I'd learned which ones looked most like art. I was very good at mimicking other artists. In fact, I couldn't get their work out of my head, particularly when I respected them. Imitating other painters is part of learning to be an artist, but at some point, a serious artist develops his or her own style. For Chuck, this involved years of experimentation. After Yale, he lived in Europe on a Fulbright grant. Then he came back to the United States and started teaching at the University of Massachusetts. The first year, I was an artist who taught. The second year, I was a teacher who also painted. I wanted to be a painter. It was time to get on with it. Chuck and his future wife, Leslie Rose, decided to move to New York and get married. They set up a loft studio in Soho, which at that time was still a run-down industrial area of the city. The loft had no heat and little hot water, but plenty of room to make art. Chuck had gone through many different styles, including mixed media constructions made from cardboard, magazine photographs, and wedding pictures. 
but he needed to move forward to try something really drastic. To rid himself of his predictable painting habits, he threw away his familiar brushes and assembled a new set of tools, an airbrush, sponges, rags, and even a, an eraser stuck to the end of an electric drill. He stretched a 22-foot long canvas. From photos he'd taken for a painting back in Massachusetts, he chose a full-length female figure. Close says, Using photographs forced me to make shapes I'd never made before, but the results, while promising, missed several of his goals. He had attempted to make each part of the figure equally important, but there were too many areas to focus on. Some were naturally more compelling than others. In addition, the scale wasn't big enough. I wanted the viewer to get lost in the painting. It wasn't practical to blow up the figure to a larger size when it was already 22 feet long. What is the first feature most people look at when they meet someone, he asked himself. The head. What about a giant head? He happened to have some film left in his camera, so he stood in front of it and photographed himself. He stared straight into the lens as if he were taking a mugshot or a passport photo. The result was a photograph of himself looking like a hippie with an attitude. Wild, stringy hair, dangling cigarette, and surly expression. He divided the photograph into squares, a grid, and penciled in a matching grid on a 7 foot by 9 foot canvas. Then he translated onto the canvas each square of the photo, including the parts that were a little out of focus. With a razor blade, he scratched the paint to get the hairs on his beard just right and he used the electric eraser to reproduce the reflections of light on his glasses. He made his painting as truthful as he could, even though the gigantic scale meant the imperfections of his face were magnified. He said he'd never considered the fact that his nostrils were shaped like lima beans, but in the four months it took him to paint the picture, he had plenty of time to think about it. Day by day, he could tell the painting felt right. This is what he'd been looking for, a concept of self-imposed rules that would form the basis for future work. What is revolutionary about this self-portrait? The large scale, the unsparing detail that forces the viewer to see the subject matter in a new way. The painting becomes a topographical map of a face with each freckle charted. The familiarity of two eyes, a nose, a mouth, a chin, is magnified into a question. Is this what we look like? Between 1967 and 1970, Close painted seven more of the huge paintings. Their sheer aggressive size made them hard to ignore when they were first exhibited. But people were also amazed by Chuck's technique. His secret tool was the airbrush. I used black paint that was thinned down, very watery. I scraped it, I erased it, and sprayed more paint on. Slowly, I sneaked up on it. In fact, the whole series of black and white paintings was made with one 60 cent tube of Mars black liquid paint. Friends have always been important to close. As a boy, he was clumsy and hopeless at sports. I couldn't catch a ball to save my soul. When I ran, I often fell down, so it was clear that if I was going to have any friends at all, I would have to find ways to get people to come to me and stay put. His father constructed a small puppet theater of wood and sheet metal in the backyard. His mother made a grand silk curtain for it, like the one at the Metropolitan Opera. There, he put on magic acts and puppet shows. Soon, his house became the center of activity for the neighborhood kids. It is not surprising that years later, when he started painting from photographs, it seemed natural to choose his friends for models. I didn't want to paint pictures of movie stars or famous people. I wasn't going to spend three to fifteen months painting someone I didn't care about. After his self-portrait, he made other big black and white paintings, including one of his good friend Philip Glass. The subject of the painting is now a well-known composer, but at the time Close photographed him, Phil was just another member of their circle, a group of young, struggling, avant-garde artists. 
post says, I've recycled Phil Glass's image for 30 years, and it's produced 30 or more different pieces. Sometimes I think I should retire the photograph, put it up in the rafters the way they do with basketball jerseys at Madison Square Garden. When he recycles the photograph, he changes the size or material. He applies different techniques and processes. For example, he has painted Phil in both large and small sizes with an airbrush, with his fingerprints, with pulp paper. Reusing the same photograph has become a dominant feature of Close's work. Some images I just connect with. It could be I'm especially close to the person or because it's an image that seems to matter more than others.